It gives me great pleasure to uh, not, only, uh, not only bring up the speaker for today, uh, who's really going to open some eyes, but also uh, to bring, uh, bring up the introducer of the speaker, uh, Dr. David Cole, I'm, I'm proud to say an old friend. And uh, I, we have only had two speakers in the history of the 25 years of this speaker series talk twice. Tom Izzo was one and Dr. David Cole was the other. And so we're very fortunate to have him here. Uh, and and I, can't, I, I don't have the time to go through all the accolades he deserved, but uh, suffice it to say that he ran CAR, the Center for Automotive Research at the University of Michigan. The guy kind of grew up in the boardroom at uh, General Motors. I don't know that on this planet there's someone who knows more about the automotive industry than Dr. David Cole, so I'll bring him up to your applause. Doc. Well, thanks very much, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Um, those of you that think the auto industry is complicated, it's very quiet, relaxed, uh, and really complicated. And you're going to hear, I think, a presentation today that uh, will bring some of the most important issues that are in play in this industry together. And when I think about uh, what we're seeing, and it's not unique to the auto industry, but manufacturing in general, uh, we see a huge number of challenges. Uh, we have challenges in terms of the speed with which technology is being developed. We have emerging areas like Way is going to talk about with autonomy. The whole concept of mobility where we may not own a car uh, in the future. Uh, by the way, Chris, when you mention an old friend, that's a bad word to use. Uh, <laughs> of long standing. Of long standing, that's right. I, I keep remind, am right, reminded of this. Uh, uh, last year, uh, a year ago, this year I turned 80, and I said I could not imagine where those years went and how fast they went. And the only thing about being, I'm 81 now, the only thing about being 81 is you can't remember a whole lot about what happened in the past. That's the reality of it. But uh, manufacturing, the auto industry is in a period of uh, extreme change. Uh, we every day hear about electrification, uh, hybrids, pure electrics. Uh, and one of the most serious issues, uh, one that is uh, potentially a uh, potential disaster for Michigan, is the issue of talent. Uh, every manufacturer, supplier uh, will tell you that one of their most important issues today is finding appropriately educated talent. And if we don't do that effectively, we're going to have some really serious problems in the future. The other point I would make is that when you talk to people about auto manufacturing, their picture is of an auto assembly line. That's a pretty small part of the business today. When you look at the earliest stages through the design, the manufacture, and the sales and service, this talent problem is everywhere and very, very serious. Well, let me talk about Wei. Wei is a fellow professor of mechanical engineering. I'm a retired professor. He is sort of retired because of what he's going to be talking about today. But the whole issue of autonomy is a really big deal. Uh, the implication is, as I suggested, that in a couple of years you'll be able to uh, sleep in the back seat on a trip. We have a cottage in northern Michigan and that's going to be very nice to be able to sleep on that trip so when I get up there I'm prepared to play golf or fish. Um, however, my guess is uh, before the fully autonomous vehicle, the level four, level five, which we will talk about, is probably beyond my lifetime. Uh, it's the reality. We tend to hype things that are not as uh, quite here as we would like them to be. Well, one of the most interesting aspects of the technology that is being developed today, and it's being developed everywhere, in manufacturers, colleges, universities, it's in many fields, it's in software, it's in engineering, uh, it's in the business side, uh, as I say, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, this technology as it is being developed, you don't put it on the road and say, uh, try it out. 
you have to really have a place where you try that in a controlled environment. And that's what uh, M-City is. It was, it's a, still a unique facility. There's a little larger one at the old Willow Run Airport. I'm sure we will talk about that a little bit too. But this facility is really designed to uh, be the first test site for autonomous technology. Um, Way has been around the block uh, in the automotive business. They said he was a professor of mechanical engineering, he's still a professor of mechanical engineering. But what he has found here in M-City is one of the most significantly interesting challenges that I think he'll run across in his career uh, anywhere. So with that, let me introduce you to Professor Dr. Wei Peng. Thank you, Dave, for the great introduction. He almost already uh, introduced all the important points I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and thank you, Chris, for the invitation. Uh, so I work at MCD. I'm still a professor, but this is a research center, which is now 75% uh, of my appointment. So I don't teach that many courses. Uh, Dave used to uh, give uh, guest lectures in the course I teach, which is integrated vehicle design. So this is really affecting all the automotive industries, almost all the OE major OEMs, many first tiers, and many second tiers, third tiers are working on some aspect of connected, automated, shared, or electrified. Uh, sometimes people say case, but if you talk to the government, remember to say ACES. Uh, these are the four trends. Uh, and today I'm going to focus on automated even though MCT focused on the first two. I will not talk about connected that much because of time, but I will have a little bit, one slide talking about the importance of connected. So th this is a plane, I will focus on AV. I will also focus on one thing that I see many people are concerned about, which is the fact many companies, especially the technology companies, mainly do their validation on public roads which, of course, like uh, Dave said, that's, first of all, not very efficient, not very safe. Um, and uh, secondly, they, they can do things much faster if they really use simulations or lab testing facilities like MCT um, as an integrated way of their vehicle design and validation. Third, I'll talk about MCT. So first, number one, I want to explain that automated is not autonomous, right? When you open a newspaper, you open a, you look at the um, TV or radio stations, they all mostly talk about autonomous or driverless. That's because Waymo, Google, has been very aggressive in making everybody know they are leading in this area. Uh, but automated is not just about autonomous driverless. In fact, this uh, is a chart which is a variation of the SAE standard. Uh, this is a, a somewhat vague definitions of different levels of automation. But what's important is that we don't jump from level zero, which is today, to level four or five, which is all robots. So if you look at the level four and five, everything is, are handled by the robots. Level four means you have some driving modes, Level five means anywhere, anytime, any weather, when it rains, snows, India, Mumbai, Beijing, no problem. That's level five. But in our view, definitely uh, it's important to introduce the concept called operational design domain. When we design an airplane, a submarine, we have a limitation. We have operational design domain. So is autonomous vehicles. So even for level four, level five, uh, chances are uh, 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 we will not see level five anytime soon. Level four will be with us for a very long time. Uh, also, it's important to say that this technology can be implemented more gradually <coughs> through level one, which is driver assistant, level two, where the robot help you to take many of the control functions. But we'll, we'll talk about the detail of this uh, uh, soon. But the, uh, the main point is we don't jump from zero to four uh, immediately. So now let me bring up the most important thing, why many companies or researchers are doing 
automated vehicle research. This is a chart. Uh, if you look at the uh, black bars, it shows the fatalities every year in the U.S. Uh, we had been about 50,000 fatalities per year. And through the years, there are up and downs. And the, the graduate improvement has been attributed to seat belt, airbags, better crash worthiness, drunk driving enforcement, and so on and so forth. Electronic stability control or other control technologies has been uh, contributing to the uh, fast uh, re uh, uh, reduction in fatality in recent years. But over the last three years, the trend has been reversed. Actually, there is a very obvious and fast increase in fatalities there's no proof, there's no, no researcher has established a solid research to explain why this is happening, but there are hypotheses. This is our hypothesis. Uh, we can see this uh, video clip. Let, let's see that video clip, yeah. That's us. That's us. <laughs> 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 okay, so that's us. And things are getting worse, not better. Robots are getting better. It'll take a few years, but let's be patient. We know humans are not perfect, for sure. Let's look at this uh, video. This is called AEB, Autonomous Emergency Braking. We don't even call that a automated level. So that's why sometimes people say 0.5, level 0.5. It doesn't really drive for you, it just saves you, last second. <laughs> <laughs> so we call that guardian, right? Um, guardian function is already standard in Europe. The reason is that since 2016, Europe NCAP, New Car Assessment Program, has required AEB being a very major portion in their grading system. So if you don't have AEB, you're, there is no hope to get five star. Because of that, basically, close to 100% of the new cars in Europe today already have AEB. In the US, uh, wait for about 2021 to 2022, many of our cars will have AEB. So AEB is also a automated vehicle function that are supposed to reduce crashes by a very significant portion, uh, roughly speaking, 15, 20% easily. And that should reduce uh, crashes, uh, reduce re repaired uh, costs and congestion. Uh, second level would be co-pilot, co so the vehicles are taking part of the control function with you. So it's not chauffeur, but it's taking, again, taking one aspect with you. The third would be then be chauffeur. So again, you should, today you can already buy level one uh, functions from many car companies, GM, Ford, many. And uh, uh, level, I will have a chart showing you the level two and also level three, not too many. And level four, today you cannot buy any level four vehicles. Waymo, even though they claim they will have service, but you cannot buy a level four vehicle yet. And level five does not exist. So let's take a look at one video. <clears throat> this is really the corporate of human uh, neuromuscular delay. On average, it takes time uh, about 0.7 seconds for us to perceive, detect, perceive, and then take actions. And that uh, average delay uh, is uh, happening on each one of these drivers. So when you have globally enough space for vehicle to drive stably, but locally you will have enough density. And here, because of the local congestion, People need to apply brake more, and when the uh, delay was accumulating, another 0.7 second, another 0.7 seconds, congestion happens. We all see this on highways. For no reason, the traffic comes to a full stop. And then you say, what happened? Nothing. 0.7 <laughs> seconds in each one of us. That's 
that is an uh, experiment that was uh, known, uh, conducted about 50 years ago. So I'm going to show you today. Uh, this is a new experiment similar to this, ex this experiment, except that the video is six times faster because it's, they want to see things faster. So it's a little bit dizzying uh, to see the video. But pay attention, most of the cars are white. There's a lit, small little silver car. And see what it does. OK. So it's very fast. <coughs> so you can see that at the beginning, the same thing happened. Local congestion build up, right? Now, let's turn on the adaptive cruise control for the silver car. Only one car. Everybody else is a human driver. OK, so the silver car played the role of being steady, steady and no delay. And then when it's stable, everybody behind it doesn't need to brake. And therefore, traffic becomes stable. So if you ask the question, when can we see the benefits of automated vehicle technologies? I'll say today. Uh, you can have AEB, you can have ACC. You can have lane keeping, and so on and so forth. And they will change the traffic dynamics. They will reduce the number of crashes, therefore reduce uh, congestion. Now you can see that things are running happily again. All right, so here is a quick chart summarizing where we stand. Uh, it's the same level, 0 to 5. There's, again, no, no level 5 vehicle. We are almost 100% level 0. Again, in Europe, we have po level 0.5 already almost standard. Level 1, you can buy many cars with uh, so-called conventional cruise control, which is not very safe. Uh, adaptive cruise control means it will be cruise control, but keep a safe distance between you and the lead vehicle. That's available on many vehicle models. Lane keeping uh, system, and they, those are level 1. Now, let's talk about level 2. The vehicles that will, I will highlight a little bit later in this talk are highlighted in red. Tesla Autopilot is not a driverless vehicle, even though some news reporters are confused. Uh, it's level two. Uh, it only controls the brake, uh, steering, and speed, nothing else. Um, so you, it doesn't really detect dogs, for example. It doesn't detect pedestrians uh, safely. Remember there was a fatal crash, when there's a semi-trailer, it doesn't see semi-trailer. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some video showing what they, it really does. But again, I think people know it as autopilot. That's an unfortunate misleading name for that function, which contribute to some of the crashes. You can buy GM Super Cruise, a much better version of autopilot. Uh, but unfortunately, it's only available on Cadillac CT6 today. Uh, but Cadillac already announced they will have a wider adoption of the uh, GM Super Cruise uh, coming soon. You can also buy from Mercedes, Volvo, and so on and so forth. Right now, there's only one v uh, company announcing a level three, which is Gen Pilot. It basically says if it's a traffic gen, Stop and go, it follow the lane, follow the car in front of you, it'll do that for you. You know, Germans like to drive fast, they don't like to drive in traffic jam. <coughs> and that makes sense. Uh, level four, uh, we already, UFM already deployed uh, Navia level four shuttles on UFM uh, campus. Uh, Uber, you have been seeing some testing happening in Finnish, killing one pedestrian. And Waymo, main mobility, Waymo has been demonstrated uh, in uh, Phoenix. They say they are all, all going to open mobility service to the general public. And main mobility, a spin off company uh, from UFM, is already operating in Detroit. So you all heard about the Uber crash. A lot of people are concerned about it. Um, this is a so-called level four vehicle, except it is, they are testing on public roads. What they should have done is to do some, many of this testing in a safe, closed facility like MCT first, before driving on roads. Um, Tesla, you also heard about a fatal crash of Tesla. 
The problem of this vehicle is the following. It's not very smart in knowing I'm going, taking, a, you know, 496 or I'm taking 96. It follow white lane marking, which is really not the right way to do it. Uh, this is, that's why one, the, uh, the, uh, one of the drivers were killed. And I'm going to show you some of the functions. This is Tesla in action. In all three cases, you see that there are some interesting scenario. And Tesla was saving the day for all three cases. I'm not so sure, are you, do you think you can handle these cases or not? I look at this, I say this is doing something right. On the other hand, you can also see Tesla doing something wrong. In this case, watch the steering wheel on the left. Okay, it's actually confused by the lane line and the shades from the trees, and they actually want to turn into the car oncoming vehicle, which is almost killing uh, the driver. And here is another case. It doesn't recognize the steering, uh, the lane line properly. Now, this is a common problem. Tesla cannot see stationary vehicle. That's the fundamental limitation of the sensing system they use. They use radar and camera only, no LIDAR, and no communication. And what happens is radar just have a lot of reflection from common stationary objects, like guardrail, like even uneven road service. Therefore, a lot of the radar system ignore reflection with uh, speed of zero. If it's a stationary object, it say that's part of the road. It's not the problem, which is not always true. Um, so to, that's today. In other words, we are um, unfortunately gradually, gra uh, gradually we learn from all these mistakes. Uh, sometimes people got killed. Sometimes they are in very risky situation. And engineers are learning more through the time. And this is a guy who was just curious why um, you know, that Tesla was doing that. Did my Tesla do the same thing? It happened that, yes, it does, except that this guy grabbed the steering wheel, not getting killed. This is another guy in another city saying, let me try. And he has similar situation. The Tesla just followed the, the white lane marking. Again, instead of going left or going right, which is what you should be doing, right? That's what we want to do. And the vehicle wasn't smart enough to do that. So today's AV are not perfect. Some uh, tech companies are more, more brave. And they sell $70,000, earning a lot of money. But the, the product is, for typical Michigan company, will never put that kind of product on road. OK, so how about other level four vehicles? This is something that has been very popular. Uh, there are more than 20 different places where people are already de deploying level four driverless shuttles. These shuttles run very slowly, and you need to select your operational design domain very carefully. Some of the cities just choose a clockwise uh, loop so your vehicle never take a unprotected left turn which is a known challenge for these vehicles. Um, so you have to pick your route. You have to look at the traffic condition. And uh, in the case of UFM, uh, we, our shuttle runs at um, 12, peak speed of 12 mile per hour. It's inside NCRC, North Campus Research Commons. It's largely uh, connecting our office buildings to a bus stop. And the main road that is running buses are, you know, speed is too high. Uh, posted speed limit 25, a lot of people drive at 35 or 40. That's too high for us. So we don't go down there. We just try to operate in an uh, area that we know are safe. Now, wh how do we know we are safe? We got our first shuttle in December 16. We tested 15 months before we deploy which is, again, very different from all many other places. Uh, this is uh, main mobility. They are deploying in Detroit uh, starting very recently, June 27th. Five vehicles, top speed only 25 miles per hour. 
they operate throughout the day to bring the employees of Bedrock Group from a parking garage to some office building. You can see, again, they choose their operational design domain carefully. It's not like, let's go on to I-94. That's crazy. Uh, so this is, uh, again, this is representing two Michigan projects where I think people who take a very cautious approach in deploying the technology. I want to say a, a very quickly about the uh, three-pronged approach for development and testing of highly automated vehicles. Like uh, Dave said, um, we think going forward, you have to do a lot of simulations. Uh, roughly speaking, 99% of your testing validation should happen in the virtual world. And out of the rest of the 1%, the majority should happen somewhere in a safe, closed test facility like MCT. And finally, maybe 0.1% on public roads. Because we have limited scenarios, we cannot reproduce all the situations, especially we don't have any potholes in MCT. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to have some on-road testing still. Uh, but this is a more responsible way of developing engineering systems to, uh, to be more certain you are safe. Another important thing is that uh, as part of the, you know, UFN has been doing automotive engineering for more than 100 years. Uh, we are now contemplating, because the government doesn't have a testing uh, standard, uh, SA doesn't have that, nobody else has. So we have been thinking how, if, if, uh, the USDOT asks us to help them to come up with a safety, uh, safety testing procedure, what should we do? Uh, we have been saying, number one, you should try to be thorough in the sense that you should, roughly uh, speaking, accumulating median miles. But accumulating median miles in a test facility is not going to be very uh, fast because uh, Driving in MCT average speed is probably 25 mile per hour, if that, and the one million miles will take a very long time. And so what we are proposing is to use the technology called accelerate evaluation, and that's based on important sampling. Important sampling was used for predicting earthquake, uh, failure of banks, and uh, uh, communication network buffer overrun. In other words, you are trying to understand the rare cases, but your simulation is focusing on the rare cases, not the typical day-to-day -day cases. So accelerity evaluation, we have found that we can accelerate the testing by a factor of uh, 100 to 100,000, depending on the definition of uh, what is a crash. And we, we think that we need to uh, continue to develop the accelerity evaluation method the second is a behavior competence. It's almost like your driver test, right? Your human driver need to pass certain driver tests. And uh, our focus has been uh, uh, accumulating behavior competence scenarios. The third is corner cases. Uh, these are uh, supposed to be interaction of multi multiple factors, pulling, marking, aggressive cars, combined with a small pedestrian like a child, uh, things like that. Corner cases can be com combinations of behavior competence cases. So we have been uh, looking at literature. This is only one of many we, we look at. This is California Pass. We look at Google, we look at Voyage, we look at Talk Robotics, and many other places where people come out and say, we found these scenarios to be uh, important uh, in our driving, day-to-day -day driving. So we look at all the, uh, including Chinese, and then we uh, combine and we say, these are the 50 um, behavior competence uh, that we think every vehicle should be put through. Uh, MCT is very small, so we cannot do all the 50. But we, uh, after analyzing where we are and what we can do, we think these are the 35 tests that we will do, and they are categorized into three types. One is just interacting with the environment. 
Second is interacting with vehicles. Third is interacting with uh, vulnerable road users like pedestrians and bicycles. So these are examples of things we are doing inside M-City and hopefully soon we'll have uh, all the capabilities to verify this AV before they are put on public roads. Uh, finally, let me uh, say something about M-City. M-City is a public-private partnership. Uh, it's led by U of M. Uh, we currently have 58 industrial members. Many are Michigan, but Japanese, uh, European companies, other countries too. Uh, we focus on connecting and automated vehicles. We are not just the test facility. So even though MCT is well known as that test facility, that's not the main thing we do. We actually have already invested uh, more than $25 million on close to 50 research projects. Uh, so research is very important. And also education and outreach, like uh, Dave properly pointed out, the lack of talent can be the biggest crisis of the state of Michigan. We need to make sure that our students are trained with the traditional strength, like vehicle dynamics, uh, like control, but also the new things like artificial intelligence, machine vision, LIDARs, and so on and so forth. Those are very important. So we are supporting faculty members, not only in engineering, but also law school, business school, other colleges, a school of information to develop courses to train our students. That's very, very important. So this is MCT test facility. Uh, it's, the idea is uh, it will include both urban and highway. It's, um, uh, it's supposed to be used for connected automated vehicle testing. Uh, this is a slide that you will see a lot of things happening. You can see we do vehicle testing. You can see augmented reality, so instead of really driving 50 cars uh, using a lot of fuel and uh, emit carbon dioxide. We do a lot of augmented reality testing. So the vehicles will emulate a urban environment in which case there's no other cars next to you. Uh, we also have uh, been simulated in two, actually four software, CarSync, PreScan, MATLAB Simulink, and the uh, newest is a small company called Righthook. We also have 5G. Uh, 5G, of course, is the new communication technology. We're still trying to understand how the new 5G technology can be used for automotive applications. Uh, this is uh, uh, MCT in a typical day, right? You can see a uh, footage from the, a drone, and all the white cars are um, automated vehicles. And here is a left turn scenario. Um, so these two cars were, were programmed to run uh, autonomously. After this challenge, you'll see this car come down, being challenged by two pedestrians. Uh, don't worry, we'll hire Ohio State undergrads for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here comes partially blocked lane line, right? This par car is parked, partially taking this lane, and you will see this vehicle uh, detect, react, and do a little bit of running around that vehicle. And then another autonomous vehicle coming here, and another pedestrian will be jumping out to challenge that vehicle. So this short video shows, uh, of course, uh, we have been accumulating about 3,500 hours of testing of automated vehicles. And also, because we are so small, if you design your choreography carefully, Every day of testing in MCT is equivalent to say 100 or 200 days of public road driving. Again, this is safe, this is efficient, cost effective. And we, all, we definitely encourage all Michigan companies and other companies to use safe, enclosed lab testing instead of public road testing. ACM, uh, like Dave said, I will say something about ACM. American Center for Mobility, uh, where I serve as a board member, I'm representing U of M. Money mostly comes from the state, um, and Michigan Strategic Fund, MEDC, and of course, uh, several other units are helping to launch ACM. ACM is 10 times bigger than M-City. So imagine M-City and make it 10 times bigger. They have a real tunnel. This is a real tunnel. It actually curves, um, and they can 
drive high speed. They also have triple decker. Many of those, all of those we don't have. We are, your fam, we are supposed to compete at this level, uh, not at the size and uh, you know, um, high speed. Um, so we are supposed to do research, develop standard uh, testing procedure, uh, talents, and hopefully we will work with ACM closely to make sure that MCT, ACM both become valuable assets for the state. Um, so this Navia vehicle, again, we got our first uh, shuttle in December 16. Uh, we tested a long time uh, inside MCT before uh, they are deployed on UFM campus. Again, this is very different from almost every other project in the world. So you can see that pedestrian, bicycle, cars running in the opposite directions. We've been running hundreds of hours of testing uh, to make sure that we fully understand this vehicle is safe. I want to say one thing uh, quickly about uh, connectivity. Um, we do connect it and automate it. A lot of car companies only believe in automated. Why are we saying that's wrong? Uh, this is one example. This is a car that's broken and parked behind and by some uh, trees, bushes. And here's the car coming, right? Human eye, camera, radar, LIDAR, none of them can see this vehicle. So if you measure the vehicle speed, it will have to brake really heavily to avoid a crash if they uh, successfully detect the vehicle. On the other hand, communication doesn't need line of sight. So this vehicle can hear through vehicle to vehicle communication and it will slow down very smoothly and avoid the crash. So we think that con uh, connectivity is a very important element for automated. Uh, the, another example I want to talk about is uh, user behavior and trust. Going forward, when vehicles become driverless, we all will be doing something else, reading newspapers, working on your tablet, your smartphone, and that's prone for motion sickness. If we really want to replace today's cars with a automated uh, function going forward, we really need to know how to drive our cars in such a way that motion sickness is not a problem. So that's another example. Okay, so what are we working on today? <laughs> this is still the biggest challenge. So this is a typical view, a uh, camera view, and you can see this very busy labeling happening, and we have to make sense. Is that a car? Is that a traffic light? Is that a pedestrian? And if so, what's the position? What's the velocity? Should I brake? Should I steer? Things like that. And this is still our biggest challenge. Um, we need this perception algorithm to be 99.999% reliable, but we are far away from that. A lot of, you, you probably will see better uh, ren um, rendering of this labeling by Google and many other companies. They are showing you the best video clip they have. Uh, we're not at 99.999. In fact, I'll say if a company is doing 98%, they are doing really well. They are leading uh, everybody else. Uh, our, many of our algorithms, we are not competing with Toyota, NVIDIA, or Google. That's not our job. Our job is to train our students. But even the best algorithm we have developing at UFN today, we are really talking about somewhere between 90 and 95%. So it, it, it's, there is a long way to go until 99.999. This is still the biggest challenge. Um, certainly by using LIDAR, we can make this much better because LIDAR is a lot more accurate and precise. And, uh, but this is uh, camera only because LIDARs are still too expensive. Uh, companies are promising $250 LIDAR, but they are nowhere near ready for uh, that price. Uh, that's it, I want to talk about uh, MCT. So again, MCT is focusing on Kinetic Automated and working with uh, many Michigan companies hoping to make Michigan the place for m mobility. Thank you very much.
Okay, so uh, we're going to take some Q&A now if anybody has any questions. Um, I don't know how many of you take notes. I was really glad to hear about the uh, 0.7 second rule because now I know to quit cursing the other drivers. <laughs> Helpful. And the other is from the uh, example of the cars backing up, um, I concluded we just need more silver cars. Uh -huh. Yeah. That should be easy. Enough. Okay, anybody have any questions? Everybody learned everything they need to from here? I, I have a question about your statistics to start this out. One of them is um, when it showed fatalities kind of going down, is there a statistic that shows whether, um, I guess, rendering people to a point of injury mm -hmm. just short of fatalities? Mm -hmm. Because we, we have a lot of safety devices that mm -hmm. keep people that's alive. Right, that's right, yeah. You know? That's right. So. If you judge from um, fatality or injuries per million miles driven, the number has been going down, both fatality and injury. Again, I, the reason I think is uh, we have better uh, everything, right? Again, seatbelt, airbag, uh, headlights, electronic stability control, ABS, all of them contribute to better control of the vehicle. And even if there's a crash, it's, you're more protected. So um, if you, again, by uh, mildly driven, uh, both are going down. Okay. All right. <coughs> Jason? And maybe more of a statement, but <clears throat> I think you're exactly right. When it comes to text messaging, our world in the collision center uh, used to be our busiest season was the winter mm -hmm. uh, because of all the accidents. And we're busy all year round. <laughs> And actually, sometimes I almost feel like it gets a little less busy in the winter because now people are paying attention, but um, instead of texting, mm -hmm. where the roads are clear and people are texting. So how much testing are you guys doing with the weather, and is that one reason why Michigan is a focal point? Yeah, well, luckily we have five months snow, so that's, a, <laughs> that's something California never has. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we are not as busy in winter. Uh, so I'll say spring to um, right before July 4th is really busy. July 4th to August, uh, it's a little bit slower. Uh, and then September, October, November, we are busy again. Uh, winter, I will say most car companies are not quite ready for winter testing yet. They are still doing the basic, uh, but some, actually want to come when it snows, they say, oh, we want to come in today. Uh, so some are ready, not all of them. So it used to be deer season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there Thank anybody you. out here from the auto insurance industry? Okay, I want to I get to you in a second. All right. Doctor, thank you for your and our presentation. Did you do any research about societal norms and, and the human condition being receptive to giving up control yeah. of, uh, of, to say, driving. Yeah. You know, we have car enthusiasts who, yeah. you know, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on sure. antique cars yeah. and yeah. we enjoy the driving experience. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so now I, I can understand where, you know, this is looking forward and the millennials may be more receptive to that. But as baby boomers, we, we, we enjoy the level of control in driving our cars. And so what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, we still have horses around this, these days. So <laughs> some people still like to ride horses, right? So um, we, we think, of course, the evolution will be like this. We believe AEB should be in every car, right? And then some form of control, collision warning, not necessarily control, but at least as a backup, uh, you know, um, backseat driver looking over your shoulder, like, like AEB. But you can imagine another guardian function not for the rear end, but for other, like left turn or other scenarios. We certainly can start thinking about more guardian function and gradually maybe uh, make cruise control become adaptive cruise control. So that you can certainly imagine that, right? So uh, we don't necessarily believe that it will be revolutionary to driverless. Uh, we, uh, we think that the evolutionary approach is uh, probably cost effective and will reap a lot of benefits of the technology already 
not waiting for the LIDARs to drop from $70,000 to <laughs> $500. It will take a long time. And many of these uh, devices are not uh, automotive grade co quality. I'll tell you, we don't have that many LIDARs. We already have four uh, failed LIDARs. So it's far away from the automotive grade reliability. So we are not ready. There, it's, it's talent, it's uh, automotive grade reliability, it's manufacturing, it's the cost, it's the accuracy, it's the perception algorithm. Many of them still need to improve. So before they are perfect, I think we, let's go from 0.5 AB to level one, to level two, instead of hoping for a jump to level four. And so you will be safe. You'll, you'll hold on to your car key for a while. <laughs> we won't. Uh, so some people ask us, right? So, oh, uh, this, it's a senior. So I went, to, I went down to Florida for a UM alum club. And uh, this uh, gentleman, he, my host, he's uh, like 75 years old. He drive a Jaguar convertible. He said, you know, I heard that if uh, these technologies are so perfect, um, human manual driving will be banned because it's a public safety hazard. I say, come on, we cannot take AR-15 away from people so your car keys are safe. <laughs> so you, you, won't be, you won't be forced to use a driverless vehicle, for sure. I, I cannot imagine that day. Yeah, Wade, the interesting thing is the Google cars are in a lot of accidents. And one of the most common one is when the Google car comes to a light, turns yellow, it stops, yeah. and the guy behind him says, yeah, I yeah. can make that light. Yeah. Yeah. True, so. Pushing the other ones. Well, the interface between yeah. uh, reasonably automated yeah. vehicles and non-automated vehicles controlled by a driver is, well, a, is a challenge. That's a really interesting point, Dave. Uh, several years ago, ITS was in town, uh, International Transportation Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was interviewing the guy from DOT, the national office, and he said the amount that we have to do on our roadways to prepare for this car is way out there as well. So it's the interconnect with things other than just other cars. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ah. Oh, Do you want the mic? <laughs> well, no, unless you want to comment from the auto engine, because you guys yeah, are going to be heavily impacted. Oh, well, that's what I'm sitting here thinking about. And interestingly, Liberty Mutual is the company that I work for, and we've partnered with Volvo. So Liberty and Volvo are like this right now, trying to create the first insurance product for automated vehicles. So I don't know if that would look like a subscription service, if that's kind of what you'd buy into it, but our whole product is based on the risk that a driver poses much less than the vehicle so removing that is a, definitely something that will impact how we prospect how we segment our market going forward so my guess will be that it'll be tied to product liability it certainly is now and as vehicles become more and more expensive that is loaded into the premium but of course we're also reducing the risk to the driver as well so we're sort of doing this with, with the meeting of the minds but as soon as the driver's out of it yeah. i don't know i'm hoping that by the time my eight-year-old can drive i won't have to worry about him <laughs> be a little while but i'd rather put him in a 25 mile an hour shuttle than anything else yeah. 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 we're driving you way out of m city with some of this question <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i want to mention that m city has working groups and in working groups uh, all the leadership circle companies s meet with uh, real experts. Sometimes, in the case of legal liability insurance working group, uh, we invite some law firms to come in. And uh, we have five uh, law firm affiliate members. And what they do is the industrial members ask questions, and the law firm go out to do the research. And we have a 100-page white paper specifically answering the question, what we, these companies think about future legal liability insurance landscape for autonomous vehicles. 
I, I know we're running out of time here, so I will try to be quick. Uh, I work for an organization called I2 Integration, uh, and Ford is a client of ours. And so we help them with their smart device link and the uh, developer program in which developers utilize to have apps uh, within connected cars, uh, which helps to uh, reduce the distraction, right? So you're not picking up your phone. Mm -hmm. You're actually able mm -hmm. to do all of that connectivity mm -hmm. kind of through through the, the head of the device of the vehicle. Um, can you speak to just, you know, briefly on, you know, what vehicles do you use in M-City? Do you play any sort of part with with that component um, and how that kind of works as far as connected, maybe not yeah. autonomous, mm -hmm. but um, I much rather would be able to speak my commands or to be able to have, you know, big buttons to be able to sift through what it is that I'm doing as opposed to, you know, picking up my phone to do those things. Yeah, so we, we do, um, our research projects were picked by our 11 leadership circle companies because this is a poor research model. Uh, so we don't answer the ask from individual companies necessarily. So the poor model is pre-competitive basic research questions such as motion sickness, how do you gain trust, uh, things like that, cybersecurity. Um, we're not developing product, but what you say are absolutely very critical. Um, we don't have a project like what you described, but certainly, um, you know, you can always work with your U of M faculty researchers directly. You don't have to go through this pooled model. Pool model uh, benefits your one dollar become like fifteen dollars, right? So we solve a lot of questions together. Mm -hmm. Wait, thank you so much. Yeah, Chris, Appreciate thank you being here. Uh, Wayne, we also want to thank Dr. David Cole for making his way back down here from up north and a load of grandkids. Um, really appreciate the information and the time you spent with us here today. Um, be sure to fill out the feedback uh, cards that are in your program. Uh, and for those of you who are at the International Business Lunch, we want to thank you for your feedback. That's how we continually improve this, uh, this format. Uh, October 30th is our business sports luncheon. Our guest will be Terry Collins. Terry is the recently retired manager of the New York Mets. I had the pleasure of playing college ball with him for about 20 minutes. The big leagues picked him up pretty quick. Uh, great guy, but I'll have a couple other teammates here for that thing, and he will give us a lot of insights into what has become of Major League Baseball. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors again so much for uh, for all of you folks for uh, being part of this, because without you, I mean, we just we don't have the wherewithal to have it happen. Um, Gary, uh, thanks so much for being uh, the photographer today. We appreciate that. Um, also, uh, these photos are going to be seen, the pictures. You can pick them off the Michigan Business network.com website uh, any sponsors who want to have their pictures taken uh, with way and Dave will do it right over here in the corner as soon as this is over and uh, with that I want to thank my staff Jeff Sarah Mosier uh, Mike Steibel uh, Jeff McCowan and uh, Chris Geiger so if you guys would give a big wave a uh, big round of applause and thank you all so very much for coming here have a prosperous day and drive carefully